welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with two uh, PhD level people, Jason Smith, a PsyD, a chief psychologist in a prison in the U.S., and Ted Cunliffe, who is a PhD clinical and forensic psychologist in private practice in Florida. And they have written a book on understanding the female offenders. So this is about psychopathy. This is about antisocial personality disorder in the female population specifically, which when I saw this as like a book that I could potentially interview people with, I was like, man, this looks really interesting. I want to take a look at this because we've we've had other people on, Dr. Cummings, um, who's like an expert in psychopathy, the biological aspects. But I'm really curious, like how do females present differently? How do we treat them? How do you treat them? So yeah, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to start out and tell me why has the female population in the jail system gone up? And it seems to have gone up like quite a bit in the last like 50 years. Well, I, I think it has to do with um, just being coming a little bit more aware that females can kind of commit crimes, I would say, is kind of what is kind of increasing some of the, the population uh, for them going up. But even though it is going up, it still pales in comparison so much to the male offenders. So it's still like 93% incarcerated are males and 7% are females. And I believe it just has to do with just under starting to become more focused on their crimes and that they commit, um, which I think has increased some of their, the numbers in terms of them being incarcerated. Okay. Yeah. And Ted. Yeah. I, I think I would add something to that, Jason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. And that is just, um, there's a lot of bias as we wrote about in the chapter. And, uh, I think historically women have been seen, uh, has uh, been infantilized. And there's been, especially years ago, there was an idea that women couldn't possibly commit crimes or be held accountable just because they're women. And I think that that's decreased mm -hmm. somewhat. The bias is still there, as we've written about. But I think they're being seen more now as capable of committing crimes and being held accountable for those. Mm-hmm especially for the sex offenses too. I think that gets a lot of in the, in the popular media too, seeing um, the teacher kind of with the um, sexual offenses against their students. And that one has seen to definitely kind of been increased and has kind of become more of the forefront. You see a lot of stories. And I think that's helping kind of break down as Ted was talking about some of the bias in terms of that women can't do these certain types of crimes. But I think it is um, becoming a little bit more understandable and and seen in in the in the popular media, which I think then also um, in terms of them just getting incarcerated, which I think is increasing the numbers. Yeah, so it was something like from 1980 to 2017, a 750 percent rise. Yes, in the amount of women, right, in the prison system, and there was also a rise in the amount of males in prison systems. So it seems like a lot more people <laughs> yeah. are put in jail and longer, like the, you know, the, the sort of the prison industrial complex of sorts that someone might argue. Yeah. I think that would just go back to also the policies and the, from the eighties and, and drug crimes and stuff like that. I think, um, and substance abuse crimes are, are very uh, common in, in female offenders. So that could also possibly be causing some of the rise as well, but, but yeah, it's probably more also to, the laws in the United States from the 80s on. Also, you talked about how there's been more people with mental illness in jail, specifically because there was deinstitutionalization of, you know, places to put them. Yes. For more of the people who are 
very unstable. And I, I see it's so hard to keep some very ill person in a psychiatric hospital longer than, you know, five days. <laughs> it's like, good luck um, arguing <laughs> with the insurance company. And, yeah. and so I see kind of the jails and the prisons, unfortunately, sort of fulfilling this place in the U.S., mm-hmm. Yes. In the U.S., as a place that mentally ill people end up, yeah. In uh, in Miami here, the the Department of Corrections in the um, Miami Dade County Jail is the largest single provider of mental health services in the entire county. Yeah, and I think we talked about in the book too. I think. I think it was like 44 states have more mentally ill people in their prisons and jails than the, the state hospitals um, by a large margin. So, yeah, it just goes back to community health and, and state hospitals that are just not being able to house them for longer periods of time. And then they commit crimes and they go to prison and then they get seen in prison for, for mental health reasons. And there's a lot less uh, just community-based psychiatric units than there used to be. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of ours have closed. I mean, right now we're operating on three in the entire county, which is probably down about, I'd say about 70, 80% what it was 30 years ago. It's unfortunate, you know, that the resources have shifted to this model that isn't always the best for treatment. Um, Yes. Okay. Well, let's, since you guys are experts on this stuff, I really want to dive into and learn from you guys about psychopathy, about antisocial personality disorder. First of all, just, just for people who are like maybe wanting to know some simple definitions, how would you say, like, what is the difference between antisocial personality disorder, you know, represented in the DSM-5 and then psychopathy, which is not in the DSM-5? How would you differentiate those two? Well, Psychopathy is a very old construct. There's a lot of confusion about the term, as we've written in the book, and we've written in a lot of other places. Basically, what you're talking about when you're talking about criminal behavior, you're talking about three things, psychopathy, sociopathy, and antisocial personality disorder. Psychopathy is a very old construct, concerns uh, personality aspects, such as affective kinds of things interpersonal kinds of things. And antisocial personality disorder is really describing criminal behaviors. It's not actually accessing personality variables. And sociopathy is actually very close to antisocial personality disorder. So that's an easy way to distinguish it, is that uh, psychopathy is really talking about the personality as well as antisocial. And the sociopathy and the uh, antisocial, which the sociopathy is really the precursor to antisocial personality disorder. They're very closely linked, and it's more related to behaviors. And also an additional point, I know we'll probably get into this a little bit later, which has to do with how do males and females differentiate? Well, in males, the central organizing factor from a personality point of view is the narcissism. So when we think about a male psychopath, you know, Carl Giacono and Reed Malloy and Bob Hare and on and on and on, lots of psychopathy researchers have written about this idea that a psychopath, a male psychopath, is basically what Reed Malloy referred to as a malignant narcissist. So you've got the narcissistic personality disorder along with the antisocial personality disorder. But with women, you don't see a lot of narcissism. It's a very, very low base rate amongst female populations in general. And what you tend to see is a lot more borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder. So in the female presentation, that's the organizing personality aspect, is that histrionic borderline continuum combined with the antisocial personality disorder as contrasted to males, which is more narcissistic, paranoid personality disorder combined with the antisocial. A new study came out that showed that 100% of ex-boyfriends have narcissism. (laughs) (laughs) Ex-boyfriends. As 
as survey as surveyed by a therapist actually no uh, it's a joke so it's it's something i'm seeing more and more in our culture so i think just if you could define like what do you mean by malignant narcissist because it seems like everyone thinks their ex is a narcissist uh well narcissism of course is a pathological self-focus somebody that has a lot of empathy problems because they're so focused on themselves they don't really consider other people they don't really interact with other people as equals that they're kind of uh you know when you think about milan's ideas of elite narcissism and these people that are just very very grandiose and self-focused etc now with the malignant narcissist you're really you're factoring in the antisocial personality disorder there. So not all narcissists are antisocials at all. You can be very narcissistic and not really have violent impulses or be someone that uh, enjoys violating the rights of other people. But when you put those two together, that's when you end up with your malignant narcissist, which Milan, under his typology, refers to it as an antisocial narcissist. And so when we think about psychopathy in the, let's say you took like, you know, this antisocial personality disorder population that ends up committing crimes that ends up in jail, what percentage of those people likely have psychopathy? It depends on the security level that you're at, but on average, uh, the data shows about 20 to 25% of people that are in prison are psychopathic. So... Most people that go to prison may meet the criteria for meeting antisocial personality disorder. Carl likes to call it like it's finding ice in your refrigerator, right? When you go to prison, you're going to find all these antisocial personality disordered people. But what sets them apart is about 20 to 25 percent meet uh, psychopathic personality. And we define that by using the PCLR, which is 30 or higher. And for females, it might be a little bit lower. It might be maybe like 15 to 20%, but it's still a pretty good um, percentage differentiating between antisocial and and psychopathic Mm -hmm. um, offenders within uh, correctional settings. And I think another, uh, an easy way to think of it is that all psychopaths are antisocials, but not all antisocials are psychopaths. That makes well, sense. Do Do you think that's the case though? Because don't you think you could be a psychopath and not break the law? Uh, yes. Yeah, we have the uh, the the successful psychopaths. Uh, successful psychopaths. Abiak I mean. have has wrote, wrote about that as well. Yeah. But not all not all antisocials break the law or, or get caught for breaking the law either. <laughs> okay. So maybe so, so, so maybe I mean, that's just better. That's the distinction that when you look at Paul Babiak's stuff, you know, he wrote the Snakes and Suits book with Bob Hare. Yeah. And he, all of his data are these guys that are on on Wall Street. Do you and, do you think there's an overpopulation of psychopathy among executives and wall street and a lot of these things do you think that there's real data to support that or is that more of a cultural myth well babiak's data supports that yeah yeah how how strongly like what percentile are we talking about because there's like what one percent females in the general population two percent males i've heard that so but like how much higher is it in you know those places where how much higher is it in places like wall street or you know, executives of companies and stuff like that. I don't know if that exists, actually. Yeah, I don't know if that data exists. Yeah, yeah. But there, but, obviously, there's probably some. <laughs> but yeah, we don't know the percentages. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about those kinds of careers, that those would attract psychopaths, somewhere there's a lot of money, power, etc. Politics is another example. Law, maybe. Law. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that was kind of, you know, in, in Cleckley's book that he wrote in 41, and he did several uh, updates on it. But in there, he takes a case study approach, you know, because he was a psychiatrist. And um, in there, he talks, he talks about the psychopath as businessman, the psychopath as psychiatrist, the psychopath as 
as a lawyer and gives lots of different examples of how psychopaths that were uh, in various different professions. Yeah. Okay. So in you have a chapter talking about bias mm-hmm. in diagnosing and understanding, assessing. And um, I really like table 2.1, talking about the different logical fa- fallacies and thinking <laughs> error. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, break down, like, why did you, why did you think this was so important to put right at the beginning of the book to really kind of explain this before you jump into the other stuff? Well, Ted, you Ted was the, well, you were the first author on it, but um, yeah. we, we thought it really did set up the book very well, uh, especially to kind of start about talking about some of the myths and then it would lead into our data and then our assessment and everything like that. Ted put in some great work. Carl had our second author. He had some really good ideas about um, just kind of looking at some of the like scientific method stuff. And then Ted found all this great data he did, uh, went through everything, looking at suggestibility and all these fallacies and biases. So what are, what are, the, what are the kind of fallacies and biases that the listeners might have coming into hearing about female psychopathy? Uh, Well, you know, we started off that particular chapter just talking about general biases that would be uh, applicable in almost any endeavor and ones that specifically apply to mental health in whatever type of research that you're doing or whatever type of clinical endeavor. And there's a whole range of those. Uh, You know, we kind of started off talking about the psychologist's fallacy, which, you know, was first pointed out in the, in the 1800s. It's the assumption that one's observations are correct, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all kinds of things like uh, confirmation bias, which what we're looking at there is kind of having a, a theory going in and you only look at the data that supports your theory and you don't look at the data that doesn't support your theory. So, you know, that would apply to diagnoses. And for females in particular, right? So we talked a lot about how male psychopathy is like the general um, view that people have when they think about assessing females or diagnosing females and by ha- by thinking all right this is the prototype they're going to be narcissistic they're going to be callous they're going to be trying to take over the interview and if you use that as your your cognitive heuristic when you're going in there uh, you're going to miss a lot of the important stuff that when we assess with the females they do not present as this narcissistic overt, callous, trying to take over the interview. It's actually, um, they may play a little bit more coy. They may be a little bit more seductive, self-focused. So I think the, the psychologist fallacy, I think, is, is a big one that, that plays a role, especially if diagnosing, assessing, treating female offenders. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how, uh, just talking about myself personally, that's kind of how I got started on it was that I was working at a female prison, a female federal prison in California. And I'd already, before I even went to graduate school, I'd actually read a lot of stuff on psychopathy. And I went to the prison and I was looking around and there were these women that were uh, getting into a lot of trouble, doing a lot of quote unquote psychopathic kinds of behaviors, didn't really seem to have any remorse yet they didn't present like what was being described in the psychopathy literature. They didn't have that kind of callous presentation. They were callous, most definitely, but the presentation was more of a kind of a friendly callousness. (laughs) 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 You know, like where they kind of portray themselves as victims and... And there was a real need, you know, when, when I was doing that in California, I was co- collecting my uh, original, my first bit of research for my dissertation. And I had a female co-researcher. We were collecting all the data together. And it was really fascinating to watch the women's uh, interactions with her and me, which was mm. completely different. And they were very, very concerned about what, 
this uh, other researcher, Amy Muntz, what their re- their reactions to her. Like they were very, you, you know, we were doing um, uh, PCLR inter-rater reliability. So we would do the interviews together. So usually one person would take the lead and then do the interview and the other person would kind of sit in the back of the room and observe and, you know, that kind of thing so that we could score these uh, the PCLR together. And even when they would be talking, they would be looking over at her, like very, very interested in her approval, coming up with excuses for their behavior, um, just very sensitive to how they were being perceived by another woman. Huh. And I think that that's something that I've observed over the years repeatedly is that they're much more, you don't get the the sort of uh, what Bob Hare refers to as the braggart coming in there mm-hmm. and just bragging about himself and all his accomplishments and, you know, this kind of thing. That what you get with the female is that Jason was just referring to as more coy, kind of a seductiveness, portraying themselves as victimized, um, things of that nature to kind of gender and s- sympathy. And those are these are key aspects when you're interviewing these women and when you're treating them, especially like your approach is much different, kind of a dry kind of just the facts, ma'am, kind of approach that you would take with a male psychopath would, would not be advised with a female psychopath. You're very lo- unlikely to get good information. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I want to get into the, um, the psychopathy checklist, I want to go kind of item by item, actually, like you do in the book and talk about the difference between the male and the female. I think it'd be a good way to organize. But before I go into that, maybe give me a couple sentences on the psychopathy checklist, um, what it is, how it was developed, what, is it reliable, how reliable, and how it's been useful in research. Okay, so... Um... Bob Hare was the one that created it kind of using up until the 1980s when when he was first kind of creating it. There was no uh, real measure of psychopathy. Cleckley, as we talked about, had some uh, lists of items that were he was describing. But Hare was the one that really put the the research um, and the time into the interview. And it's an interview, and um, it's not a self-report, uh, which is very key, especially when you're assessing a population that lies and manipulates. He thought it was best to put in an interview. So in 1980, he started collecting his uh, data for the interview process, and then it was revised in 91, and then 2003, it kind of came out. It is it is very reliable. It is very valid. With males, as we kind of talk about in the book, there's some things that might be a little bit different for the females, but in comparison to a lot of times researchers or even clinicians use the personality, uh, the PPI, which is a self-report measure, or they try to use the PAI to diagnose psychopathy, PCR is the only one that shows uh, valid ways of kind of comparing groups of psychopaths versus non-psychopaths as well as self-report is just, it's not going to get the same as as an interview. One thing that I'll I'll talk about though in the PCLR, you have to do a file review before you do the interview. A lot of times researchers will not do a file review and don't have any corroborating evidence. Um, So when they ask the questions, they just take the inmate's word as valid. So uh, for example, a female would say, if you didn't do a file review and see that she had a a whole list of charges and you ask her, have you been arrested before? And she says, no, you would score that a zero. But if you actually looked at the record and said that she had all these different categories of offenses, obviously your numbers um, are going to be higher. So it's very important to make sure that you do the the file review before the PCLR interview, which makes it um, very yeah. valid and reliable. And, and Ted probably can add, add more to that, too. A couple of things to add. Just uh, that these inter-rater reliabilities are extremely high. These are up around 0.98 now, reliability. Is, which is, is that when the two people are in the same room doing the interview? Or is that when they're doing separate interviews? Because 
I, I imagine that when they're in the same room watching the same interview, that would be high. But then if they're doing their own interview, is it lower? Well, well most of that data is actually from file review. Oh. So not actually being present in the interview, but going over somebody's notes. This is what I did with Carl Giacono. You know, we didn't actually talk about this, but this is a three generational group you've got here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carl Giacono was my major professor and okay. supervised my dissertation. Wonderful. And then I went to academia and I was running a forensic program and Jason came into the university and he was one of the students there and he, he was my TA for four years. And then through that, I introduced him to Carl and now the three of us have been going along here. So <laughs> just that that's a side issue, but <laughs> I think uh, that uh, most of this stuff was done when Carl and I did my inter-rater reliability, these were, you know, detailed notes that I'd taken during the interviews and submitted to him all of that data along with my my uh, scores. And then he would look at all the data and he would score it and we would do an inter-rater reliability. And we did the same thing with Jason mm -hmm. and his data. So uh, I think routinely... Um, what we were doing there with Amy, what I was doing with Amy months was you want to do inter-rater reliabilities on all the PCLRs you do. But in that case, we were just establishing, taking 20, doing 20 interviews together and establishing inter-rater reliability. So yeah, when you think yeah. of it, you know, the 0.98 that's referred to in the PCLR manual, that those weren't interviews that were done with two people in the room. Those were file record and even um you know andrew wong has actually demonstrated that you can that you can do a score a pclr uh without an interview if you have enough information not file. that you would want to do that but uh oh. just to kind of touch on the point that jason was just uh, talking about about the importance of doing a record review beforehand and I completely agree with what Jason's saying in terms of, you know, that's important information to know going in, especially when they're talking about their records and that kind of thing. But when I do them, I always, I use that information to challenge them. Usually I do that at the end of the interview because some of these items that when you're talking about manipulation, pathological lying, poor behavioral controls, all of these kinds of things, that it's one thing to say to the person, oh, well, you know, do you have, do you have issues with getting mad? Do you flip out on other people, you know, looking at data to suggest they got poor behavioral controls? And there's a difference between doing that and trying to recreate it in the middle of the interview. So that's something that I always do where I kind of pretend like I'm really upset <laughs> that they've lied to me. Oh, you know? and I'll <laughs> say stuff like, you know, this is just beyond the pay. I just can't believe this. I can't believe that you're coming in here and you're lying to me like this. Like this just goes to show you, right? I don't <laughs> like this kind of thing. And just to see what they're going to do. Yeah, like somebody that's a two is going to go, you know what? Doc, why don't you just <laughs> take the next bus out of here, you know, blah, 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 blah. Versus somebody that's low is going to go, oh, well, hey, sorry, you know, I, you know, try to repair the relationship, that kind of thing. So I think it's very valuable information to have going in. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I once had a, a homeless person. I saw them and I, I made them food and they knew where I lived. So they came to visit me at two in the morning to ask me for money <laughs> and um, me wanting them to get away. I gave them a little bit and, and then they came back with a pie and they had a story. It was a, it was a, it was a sad stop story. And I, I thought, Hey, maybe this is real, you know? So here's $40. So I was telling my rowing buddies and two of the other guys had the same story from this guy, right? So I'm like, oh man, I was calling this guy. <laughs> so he comes back with a pie and he's like, I'm, my wife made a pie for you to thank you. You know, he was working on the long con, right? <laughs> and yeah. 
I look at the pie and it's like a Safeway pie, right? So it's not <laughs> like his wife made this pie at home. And I took his pie and then I said, you know, you're you're lying to me. You've told this story to many people, you know, and I'm really sad because, man, I trusted you. And he's like, that's, that's not true. And, um, you know, I, I took a picture of him. I texted it to my friends real quick and they confirmed it was the same guy. And I'm like, look, they're confirming it was you. And he got really, really upset and left. <sighs> I was so <laughs> yeah. devastated that someone had like, swindled me you know here i was trying to do good yeah. in the world <laughs> feeding a homeless person yeah well i think that's one of the things that we talked about in the book yeah. in terms of this idea of armchair kind of psychopathy assessment where you get people that aren't clinicians or if they are they have clinical background they do very very little in the way of actual clinical work anymore apart from supervising people. But when you're a clinician, uh, you get, just like you're describing, you get full frontal, you know, like the idea, like if you if you go to work with this population, if you go to a prison, go into the prison, and I used to tell the students all this, this all the time, so it's not a matter of you're going to get fooled. It's just yep. when you're going to get fooled. <laughs> yep. <right>? Yep. Um, <laughs> so I ate his pie. It was pretty good. <laughs> I was sad and I ate his pie. I was like, afterwards, I was like, maybe I shouldn't have eaten that pie. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, yeah, I, I was thinking about, like, what is the purpose of educating, like, the general therapist about this content, right? And some of the most painful patients, the most painful patient interactions are people who want something from us. They want to boister their disability claim. Mm. They want to, um, they want us to get to sign off on long-term disability when we don't really feel they need it. You know, I had this one client a while ago who like, I'm going to change some details here, but she had a, um, a lawsuit ongoing for a head trauma that she had had, you know, and I, I work, my specialty is like, or part of my specialty, I guess, part of it's psychotherapy, part of it's, um, you know, people with medical and psychiatric issues, right? So I run this IOP partial program for those types of people. So I've seen a lot of TBIs and I've seen like what real TBIs look like. And this, this woman did not have a TBI, right? It was just so <laughs> obvious, but she was, she was suing for a TBI and um, she had no contact with her kids. Her husband was a, you know, she described him as like this evil person. And, um, you know, after a while, like, it seemed like there were some lies occurring, you know, like incongruent affect, like 10 out of 10 depression, but she's been in the program like five weeks. No one at five weeks still had 10 out of 10 depression. Um, superficial, but then sort of uh, not disconnected from people. And I was read as I was reading your stuff on the psychopathy checklist, which we'll go through. I had this person in my mind just thinking like, oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. I actually did that with a an offender once. Okay. A female offender. Because I was actually think? doing treatment with her and she was a psychopath. Okay. And, uh, you know, you don't want to do insight-oriented therapy with psychopaths obviously because they're not really capable of that kind of thing and you'll just end up getting manipulated but i have done treatment very behavior focused treatment yeah. so she sat back and she goes yeah yeah give me the give me the list right <laughs> give, me the, give me the laundry list so i kind of went through the this i went through all the items with her and she goes yeah yeah i've, I've got yeah i think you're right yeah i've got that yeah uh-huh yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay, let's um let's go item by item because I really want to like I think this is going to help sort of educate and sort of open our eyes to what is psychopathy. So okay. item 1, glibness and superficial charm. So, how do you see this differently in females and males? So, for the males, it, uh, Hare kind of talks about it as kind of this used car salesman, like boastful, you know, just kind of just work in the room, things like that. Uh, but 
overt and and boastful um, in terms of that. But for the females, the the superficialness could be the coy, the seductiveness. They they could kind of do some of their you know like trying to to sell things, but it, it just presents not to this. Uh, like overt kind of level of things, very kind of using their appearance to kind of um, charm the person, kind of that superficial charm. I'll give one example. It was probably, uh, I was doing research uh, in a correctional setting. I think it was like the first female that I interviewed and she didn't realize she was coming to meet a male researcher. So uh, when she found out that she was in the hallway in front of all the other female psychologists, she stopped, she put her hair up in a, in a bun to kind of make herself kind of appear uh, more attractive or, or physically um, appearance was very important to her. And then the next time I met with her, she knew she was coming to meet with me. She was all makeup up. She had uh, earrings on, her hair was all done. Again, it's kind of that playing that coy, seductive kind of superficial charm um, that we see normally with these females. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I think with the females, it's much more subtle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a, it's kind of a wink, uh, body posture, that kind of thing. You know, like I, uh, I love shoes (laughs) and, uh, you know, I go out of my way to spend a lot of money on really nice shoes. So I remember this one female psychopath, you know, she just zoomed in on my shoes. Mm. <laughs> just kind of like, oh, wow, wow, those are great shoes. You know, like a lot of doctors come in here and they, you know, they dress like shit. But let, I mean, look at that. Mm. that. Those shoes are great. Yeah, those are really terrific. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Kind of, yeah. She got you pegged, man. <laughs> That's right. yeah, exactly. She, she was like, <laughs> she was, she, she observed what you really found fascinating, what you enjoyed, what you, what you were into. Right. And oh, she yeah. compliments and sort of da- puts down the other people, you know, at the same mm-hmm. time, right? Yeah. Right. Um, the evaluation is huge. They, they, and they do it subtly, like a passive aggressive style. Build you up, but devalue you, uh, devalue the other people. It's right. It's a, a little bit of like stroke, stroking your narcissism, maybe a little bit of the narcissism yeah. we naturally have, right? Right. It's like the, um, you know, devaluing all other psychologists have do not have the style that you have you know <laughs> right. and and try to split you from your other colleagues too right so then you're thinking out like you're oh man i'm i'm so much better and then that's going to play a role especially if you have to interact uh with them on a long-term basis yeah they're they're really good and they do it right off the bat it's it's yeah. kind of like they just go into that mode like right well, off the bat i was uh working at a prison in florida here female prison and I could hear some of the female uh, inmates talking amongst each other out in the hall. And one of the older females uh, was talking to one of the younger ones. She goes, look, honey, you got to lay a foundation, right? So you go in the first couple of times, you know, you do this, 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 and you're kind of laying a foundation. Because, man, if you get a DR, like a disciplinary report, if you get a DR, you're going to want to you know them to say some nice things about you mm. <laughs> so you that's know. good that's really good advice <laughs> yeah you said when strategies fail to engage the examiner the underlying malevolence may surface in the mm. form of aggressive devaluation tell me about yes. give me like a story i want to hear a story about that <laughs> well yeah i can think of one uh very infamous psychopath that uh, we have in our data set, which I'm not going to actually go through exactly who it is, obviously, <laughs> although it wouldn't really matter that much because she's since passed away. But, um, you know, I did the interview, I did the psychopathy interview. And, you know, at the end of the interview is when I, the end of the interview is when I typically challenge people. Because if you got somebody that's high and poor behavioral controls and they go off on you in the interview, then the rest of your interview is, is done, right? Yeah. You're not going to get the information. So I always do that at the very end, just in case. So anyway, so I was doing that with her and pretending, you know, that I was upset that she'd been lying to me, that kind of thing. And uh, then, you know, 
through that, she became clear, you know, that I was sort of in her mind, at least, uh, was kind of, this was the first time I was actually seeing her for who she is. And then, so then, uh, you know, she got very upset. She kind of lashes back at me and glares at me. And she says, you know, you better give me a good evaluation because if you don't, I am going to come back here and uh, you are going to rue the day you ever crossed me. <laughs> it's like, okay, right? I mean, that's oh, the kind man. of thing where you kind of get this sweet presentation. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as you call them and you bring it up to them and you put it in their face, almost like a mirror that you've kind of got them, then that's when you get the, you know, and it's, and it's all related to what we were talking about earlier in terms mm-hmm. of this need to be approved. Yes. approved of which you don't see in the men like a man would probably if you confronted them like that they probably laugh like a true male psychopath <laughs> no you just kind of, <laughs> yeah. ah, ah, you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. you got me doc yep. you got me that's right yeah uh, yeah <laughs> but doc let's talk about the the game last night huh? <laughs> you know switch the tra- right. yeah, exactly um, okay, so you talk about sexualized verbal, and we're still talking about glibness, superficial yeah. charm. You talk about sexualizing the staff um, to get money, drugs, preferential treatment. So, how do you train, you know, psychologists going in there to not fall prey to being sexualized? Well, I think it has to go with boundaries. I think that that has to be the biggest thing, and then just letting them know the environment that. These women, you know, they're really good at the the glibness, the manipulation and, and things like that. And uh, to consult, like if they have any questions, I tell all the psychologists like, hey, please reach out. Let's they want us to split. They want us to, to be off on our island. So if we consult, we can stop the behavior kind of like you were you did with the uh, the guy that was bringing you the pie. Right. You went out, you reached out and, and you found that this guy was doing it to everybody. So telling the the psychologist that it's a part of your job, but, you know, setting the boundary and working collaboratively and stopping this um, is, is probably the best strategy um, Mm -hmm. uh, working in definitely in a prison setting where you you see it also from a, from an awareness point of view, one of the things that I always try to do myself and I, you know, people that I've supervised have advised them to do is pay close attention to the counter transference and what it feels like mm. to be in the room. Yeah. What is that counter transference that you're becoming well, wary like of? A, like a predatory, a dangerous predatory psychopath. The counter transference is you feel like a piece of meat mm. and you're looking over your shoulder, making sure there's an officer there, right? In case this guy. <laughs> gets violent with you or a woman gets violent with you Uh, but also the sexual aspects the same thing like if you start to feel flattered and you start you you know start shifting in your seat and you're just kind of like oh yeah i mean these are things to pay close attention to yeah yeah it's something freud talked about a lot right right about that the sexual transference yeah 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 and you know if they're if they're more skillful which probably the most skillful are not in a jail, <laughs> right. and, um, and then they're they're probably skillful for a reason. Yeah. Okay, item two, grandiose. So this is still the uh, the psychopathy checklist. And item two is grandiose sense of self worth. So maybe we could talk about that first in the males. Um, you talk about bravado, not not aware. They are not flattering. Um, <laughs> they take control of the interview, dominance, contempt for others, self-assured, opinionated, cocky. Anything else you want to add to the grandiosity of? It, it's their narcissism. They are the, that is where it comes out. Really, they're, they're so grandiose. You know, they they they'll they'll say that they they do all these great things just to kind of pump themselves up. Yeah, would be the male version, which is also tends to be the the view that most people have of what psychopathy is this grandiose kind of person and then when we we transition to the females it looks completely different um uh for the females yeah i think also 
uh, Jason, is this lack of insight. Mm -hmm. A big part of that. Yeah. So, you know, when I assess this item, I always say something like the following. uh, Well, hey, you've accomplished a lot. Can you tell me uh, what some of your uh, talents are? Like, what are you good at? Yeah. And then they'll go on and on and on, almost to the point where you have to kind of go, okay, okay, yeah, I got it. That's enough, right? <laughs> and, then, and then you ask him, okay, well, is there anything that maybe you think you need to work on? And then they'll just be like completely stumped. You know, they'll be like, oh boy, I don't know. Gee, that's a really tough one. Yeah. So things that I don't like about myself, is that what you mean? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't really, uh, well, I don't know. I can't really, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's that kind of lack of insight. Yeah. I mean, this is somebody that's, you know, in some cases doing life in a prison. Yeah. For right. Killing people. Right. And still they, 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 they're just incapable of coming up with any of their shortcomings. Or just being in prison in general. You've committed a crime. There's probably something that went wrong in your life, right? That you need to work on. <laughs> and they just right. they just don't get it. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting in, in like outpatient. So I do a lot of outpatient stuff. I'll 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 get some patients that maybe have a flair of the, mm-hmm. the grandiosity. It's hard for them to seek treatment, period. Mm-hmm. You know, they seek treatment for other reasons often. Um, help me deal with this person in my life who, you know, I'm perfect and they're just like, I, I, years ago had this person who I tried to reveal that there was two sides of the dysfunction in the marriage and he was gone. I never saw him again. I never yeah. saw him again. And I, you know, of course I was pretty young in my profession at that point. And I was like, man, I guess too much truth, you know? <laughs> yeah, they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> you, you had a quote in the book, unwanted truths are not popular. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That was a big theme in the book, not only for the population, but maybe also some of the people reading it. <laughs> well, let's talk about females. So that grandiose sense of self-worth, how do you see that and in that in, in differently in females? This is a big one. And, and Carl kind of started in his 94 book kind of uh, looking at it, but Ted really and in, in his research and his articles in the late 90s or early 2000s, calling it not grandiose sense of self, but more pathological self-focus, meaning they, they like looking, uh, talking about themselves, liking being the center of attention, life of the party, but they have this kind of underlying like damaged self. So they are less likely to list a whole bunch of things that they're great in. Might, and it might be more superficial thing, like I like my hair, uh, a physical feature, but it tends to be, they, they like this attention. And um, Carl's kind of talked about it, Ted's kind of talked about it. They like looking at themselves in the mirror, but when they do, they don't like what they see which is the opposite of the, the male psychopath. They love looking at themselves in the mirror and they think they're Adonis and, and perfect and, and nothing is wrong. So it, the pathological self-focus is, is much different uh, for the females. And it is one of the big differences between the two males and female psychopaths. And it's something that actually drives a lot of their thinking mm-hmm. and their and behaviors. behaviors. Yep is this kind of idea of uh, chronic self-criticism where they're very concerned about how they're being portrayed or being seen by other people, what other people think of them. You know, they're very almost consumed by it versus the males. um, They're really not consumed by that at all. Like, like they don't really seem to, to care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if it, they, if they're confronted with somebody that obviously doesn't share the same opinions of themselves, then they typically, well, well, it's jealousy or, you know, I mean, it's obvious how awesome I am. How could anybody not, you know, yeah. whereas that's not the kind of presentation that you get with females at all. I so don't get that. I'm struggling with how that's grandiosity though in females. Is it because it's a, or it's, it's, it's that constant look 
that constant self-focus, the constant sort of need to maintain an image. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we think we we don't think a grandiose really captures it well on female, so that's why we th- we would we just kind of change. We would think about uh, modifying the item name even for that that. The grandiosity really what Harris kind of described in the PCLR really doesn't describe the the the, the female as much. But they do again, they, they do share this this intense kind of self-focus, both both males and females, but again, how it's kind of portrayed is different. One of the lines you said is when talking to a female about STDs and stuff, she said, My <laughs> my blood is cleaner than Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the, there's a little example of the grandiosity, right? Oh, uh, that person, that was, that's the highest person I've ever uh, on the PCLR ever tested. Uh, she was 38.9. And the only reason why she didn't get 40 is because just didn't have enough data to, so I had to admit a couple items, but she, oh, she, yeah, she was severely psychopathic, but yeah, she, um, uh, she was definitely uh, grandiose, but she also, again, like had that self-focus, but also had some of this damaged sense of self. So she was kind of our prototypical uh, female psychopath, at least from from my interviews. And Ted has his own as well. So, hmm. okay, let's let's go on to item five: conning and manipulative. The quote the quote from the uh, psychopathy checklist is the use of deceit and deception to cheat bilk, defraud, or manipulate others, the use of schemes and scams motivated by a desire for personal gain, carried off in a cool, self-assured, and brazen manner. So yeah, so the conning and manipulation for the females tends to kind of use, going back to kind of the superficial, kind of using the uh, sex as a kind of wave to kind of manipulate their appearance uh, as manipulation tactics, tends to kind of be where they're kind of coming from for their cunning and manipulation. Drug dealing, they may they may be doing some drug dealing and things like that and selling them less than they would normally in a, in a drug deal or burning them or things like that and tends to kind of be some of the cunning manipulation kind of behaviors. And, and Ted might want to speak a little bit more into some of the stuff that he's seen as well. But sex is a big thing in terms of how they manipulate. Um, using their appearance. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, I think the important thing to keep in mind with all of it, and it has to do with the narcissism or lack thereof in females, is that you don't get this overt kind of out in your face kind of presentation. So all of the manipulation is another example where it's very subtle Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. And, uh, you know, because there's so what Carl and I started calling a uh, pseudo dependency way back when this was in the late nineties or early two thousands, this idea that they're very, very concerned about how they're being portrayed. So, you know, the females are a lot less likely to actually tell you the kinds of manipulations that they've done because women, uh, you know, I think all guys, just because of the male culture, all guys can kind of relate to antisocial, at least on some level, whether it's involvement in sports or just being with other men. Like there's that kind of, you know, being tough, you know, being a man, that kind of thing. And with women, you know, like my wife, for instance, I mean, she's completely disgusted by like female offenders, right? <laughs> like, it's just like, ew, that's disgusting, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, you don't get that when men think about male criminals as much. So they're very concerned about how they're being perceived by other people. So the manipulation tends to be very kind of subtle and they're a lot less likely to tell you about the kinds of things that they've done and how they've screwed people over etc and they usually they'll have an excuse for it Mm -hmm. a rationalization Uh, someone made me do it or you Mm -hmm. know i was on drugs or things like that and yeah so you have to kind of tease that apart take their rationalization out look at the data look at the files look at how other people observe the the behavior i think it also goes to to the interview style mm-hmm. that you adopt 
like you kind of have to come across as very supportive and non-judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in order to get them to actually talk to you about what's been going on and what they've, you know, in yeah. order to access the information for some of these items. You talk about um, pseudo emotionality and superficial concern for others and in interest of secondary gain, specifically mirroring. They want to be mirrored. Yes. And, and the mirroring that you're talking about, is that, is that the same thing as like they want this image that they're holding of themselves to be um, mirrored by you? They want you to see this image of them? Is that what we're talking about or is that something else? They want to be emotionally mirrored like – they they want you to to kind of like cheerlead for them like it, that tends to be a lot of the times uh, you know they they come in here they can't regulate their own emotions so they they from my experience they they come to me you know this is what's going on hey build up my self esteem help me regulate this emotion mirror back kind of like that I'm doing okay but you know I'm just going through some stuff but it's going to be okay so they kind of use and it's a kind of very emotionally draining in terms of kind of the counter transferences, they want to get this, this self, they have this damaged view of themselves. So they kind of want to get propped up. Hey, what I'm doing is okay. So the mirroring kind of is like kind of cheerleading for them and giving them a, uh, that their emotions are, can be regulated by somebody else. Cause they tend to, a lot of the times in treatment, that tends to be the case. Uh, they come in, they're all over the place, labile emotions. And by the end, you know, the, there's a little bit sense of stability short lived, but in that session, it's just a way to kind of tease that apart and, and mirror back that I'm an okay person, even though that they've done all these crimes, that's what they're trying to get at with that pseudo emotionality. And then Ted, um, this was one of the, the findings that he found all his research was that really that this, this shallow kind of affect that they may present like they have this, kind of deep felt emotions um, and they have this labile emotions, which you might think, oh, they have a full range of emotions. But Ted's research really did show that it's very uh, short lived and, and it's not as deeply felt in terms of that. That's why we kind of called it pseudo emotionality. And Ted probably can uh, add a little bit more to that. Yeah, I think it's uh, this concept of uh, pseudo dependency plays a big role in this. In, uh, and, you know, what Jason's saying is completely, you know, I completely agree with that 100% that they're looking for another, an interaction with another person in order to build up their sagging sense, their sagging self-esteem, their sagging sense of self. And, uh, you know, this is where the, 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 the borderline personality organization kind of comes into play here, that there's an emptiness that they have and they feel empty. They'll tell you that they feel empty and they're looking for somebody to come and help fill the void, whether that's through interaction or support when they come in, uh, things of that nature. So these are all, you know, these are, uh, these are linked concepts in terms of, you know, what would be driving some of this, kind of behavior that we see. Yeah. A couple quotes here. I am exceptionally emotionally intelligent. How I manipulate emotionally, I get like a virus. I infect them. Yeah, that was, uh, that, that goes back to the Jesus person as well. Okay. <laughs> the same. Like I said, she had some really good quotes, but she, she knew how to use emotions. She knew what the mm. people are looking for and how she's supposed to react and use that to manipulate uh, that type of uh, behaviors. It, it almost feels, Jason, like she knew that you wanted something a little bit more salacious. She knew that you wanted something a little bit more like, you know. She, she, she also mentioned she read books about Ted Bundy and, and all these things. So she was more than happy to answer some of these questions. So uh, I think, uh, again, she, I think she viewed herself on the same lines as Ted Bundy and some of the other serial killers. Well, actually, your comment, what you just mentioned, both of you, is kind of sums up how psychopaths manipulate in general. Yeah. Is that they give, they, 
they are able to assess somebody very quickly and very accurately, and then they give them what they think they need yep. as a means to manipulate. Yep. So, you know, like if somebody is like looking down and or, you know, looking at their clothes, thinking, you know, they'll say something like, oh, wow, you know, you're looking good today. Yeah, those, those pants are nice. Yeah, you know, like this kind of thing. Yep. And they're giving you what they think you're what you need. Yeah. They do that frequently. Lay the, lay the foundation, right? That's right. <laughs> lay the foundation. Um, another quote. I wasn't taken advantage of. I need certain things. All women do that. Use sex. Here's another quote. Hustled pimps out of money. Yeah. Another, another quote. I turn people into addicts. I'm a master manipulator. I make shit happen. I can get that shirt off your back, Doc. I'm a money maker in the street. I talk a good game. Yeah. You know, they, they, they come out with it. Once you start interviewing them in the interviews and all the other measures we give kind of break down their defenses. So after a while, there was definitely one that said like in the beginning, like, oh, that poor guy that I manipulated, it wasn't his fault. By the end, she was like, yeah, that guy was stupid. He knew what he was doing. He knew. So, you know, you come with this empathetic kind of interview style that Ted was talking about. And by the end, they kind of open up and, and they feel they want their kind of their their voice being heard but again subtle but it, it, it does take a little bit of time but we were able to get some as you can see some good quotes okay item six lack of remorse so let me read the quote here experience a general lack of concern for the negative consequences that his actions both criminal and non-criminal have on others and you also kind of group this together with um callous Lack of empathy, which means to attribute and behavior that indicates profound lack of empathy and callous disregard for the other's feelings, rights, and welfare of others. He is cynical and selfish. So how is this different in males and females? Well, yeah, definitely those two items do kind of um, come together. For the females, especially for the lack of remorse or guilt they'll kind of know like the definition of, of what they should say like when you ask them if you ever felt remorse or guilt they'll give you back the the definition but it, it, again it's this superficial kind of lacking of knowledge and and things like that and they'll, they'll do a lot of shame um they'll say like you know my my crime has hurt my family my children but then when you actually get to talking to them about what it really is doing they they can't give you any any details. And then sometimes you'll see that they really haven't talked to their children since they've been incarcerated or they don't know how they're doing, or maybe they gave them up for adoption. So they'll present like they've done bad things. They have this shame, guilt, remorse, but it's still kind of that, it, that in-depth lacking knowledge, very shallow kind of thinking in terms of, of those specific type of emotions. And then with the callousness, the males are over. They'll 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 hurt uh, animals. They'll hurt. Uh, they'll trash houses for fun. They'll laugh about it. Overt kind of callousness. We really didn't see that much with with the females. There, there's some, but for the most part, um, their callousness more kind of verbal gossiping, passive aggressive kind of things um, in terms of how they like lack empathy and, and callousness uh, for the two. And, and you talked about a loner by choice for the males. Do you see often when they have this lack of remorse or they have this uh, callous lack of empathy, they just, they don't have very many affiliative attachments. Is that what you guys were thinking? And that goes back to kind of what Ted was talking about, that pseudo emotionality, right? Male psychopaths can kind of be on their own, like the lone wolf kind of thing. They don't necessarily need people, but the females, some again were loners by choice, but their attachments are are, are, are the opposite. They they have more attachments. They need people to to uh, give them either attention or help them with their emotions, things like that. Yeah, so and that's ahead, that's Tim. reflected in their offenses too. Mm -hmm. That women are much 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 more likely to offend against people in their social milieu, whereas males male psychopaths much more likely to offend against strangers like there's a lot more you know there's a lot of detachment 
in males. And this came out, you know, on the Rorschach data. When you look at Carl Giacono and Reed Malloy's data, you know, 91% of their psychopaths had no texture responses on the Rorschach, meaning detachment and inability to, to develop uh, attachments to other people. But you're going to have to, you're going to have to like break that down to someone who doesn't know what that means. Texture. Texture. Yeah. Texture. So when you, they look at the blot, they'll be seeing texture there. Like, oh, it looks soft. It looks furry. In some cases, they'll actually try to like rub the blot because it, it gives and, a sense and of psychopaths texture. don't have that. No. Male see, psychopaths. Male psychopaths, no. No. But one of the things that we found is that there were, uh, there were a lot of women who did have that. And the sample that we had, about 52% of the psychopaths had no texture. But then there was another group, another 30%, who, not all, who had more than two. Some, in some cases, they had seven or eight textures. So what we're looking at here is very severe dependency. And Jason, in his work, actually kind of followed, went beyond, uh, you know, what Carl and I did initially and started looking at some of the other dependency-related scores on the Rorschach and started to find that they were having like a really high scores on those too. So, you know, dependency is a big aspect here. Uh, it, how do you define dependency in the, Ro- the Rorschach, Rorschach? With the different variables and... Um, or like, what, what do you mean by dependency, I guess? Interpersonal that's... dependency. So not necessarily like um, how they, they um, need other people for interactions, things like that. So interpersonal dependency. So not like substance dependency or anything like that. So more um, attachments and, and, um, and, those, and maladaptive neediness, I guess would be the good way to kind of talk about it. And so people with that dependency, they see more textures. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep. Yep. More textures. They give more texture responses when they, when they give the, the, uh, when they're given the Rorschach, uh, inkblot test. Wow. But that's that's an interesting. They, and more, they have a whole vocabulary and more that food responses. Yeah, yeah. and you want to talk about the ROD. Well, the, there's just another scale too, depending on the content of their stuff that that could look at oral dependency, um, and it's calculated based on how many they give and how many responses. But it, it those those measures of dependency, whether it be texture responses or uh, the ROD, which is called the ROD scale on the Rorschach, those are two big differences between males and females. Males really have low scores. Uh, male psychopaths have low scores. Female psychopaths have high scores. And then this goes back into our, our differences between males really more detached, females more attached, but it's 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 maladaptive. It it's maladaptive neediness, needing others to to kind of help them with their emotions or give them attention, things like that. Mm-hmm. And it and it relates to this particular these two items. Yes, that you're talking about in terms of the callousness. You know, when Jason was just giving his example of interviewing people and uh, how they will say things on the surface that would suggest that they actually do care about other people and they have empathy and they're not callous and things of that nature. But one of the things that you find is that they'll, the women especially, will say things that they think that you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with their need to be accepted, which is related to the interpersonal dependency that we were just talking about. So... You know, you ask them, uh, well, is there anything, you know, do you feel guilt? Well, of course they're going to say yes, because they want to have a positive appraisal from the person they're talking to. And you talk especially about a desire for mirroring of an image she attempts to maintain, and specifically as like a good mother. And you talk about how from the, the chart review, you find little interest in her children, or their activities, no attempts to maintain contact with them. That that's what that's essentially like 
some of this like lack of it's it's not callousness but it's like kind of a cold indifference is that what yeah. you're talking about mm-hmm. yeah yep and definitely yeah um they'll they'll put out uh, especially in like group therapy, they'll put out, oh, I'm such a bad mom. Can't believe I did this. And what what they're getting at, the other group members then will be like, no, you're a good mom. I, I see you doing this stuff. But that's not, it, it's just, again, mirroring back. And they they want it from the, the psychologist, the therapist, the clinician. But they also like to get it from the other uh, inmates as well. So, oh yeah, you are a good mom. You're doing the best you can. You're working on yourself. Uh, to kind of boost again up this that hey maybe you're mirroring back this kind of good mother image or good friend or wife or whatever it may be and i think also if it's initially if that information isn't out there they're not going to tell you that that they were like a bad mother the typically the story you get is that they're really a good mother Mm-hmm. And they care deeply about their kids, and they, t- in some cases, they'll even tell you that they talk to them all the time. Yeah. But they, yeah, when you look at the record review, there's really no evidence of that. That in some of these cases, they've had no, they've had no phone calls with their kids. They've yeah. had no uh, letters from kids. They've had no visits. Or, and, or to, to piggyback what you said, Ted. Their their charge is against a sexual offense against their child, and they they shouldn't be having any. It also goes back to that. I'm a good mom, but you're here for thirty years because you uh, sexually assaulted your your child. Mm-hmm. Yet they're portraying themselves as a good mom, and you know something bad. You know, going back to that. So, well, yeah, I mean that's a whole other issue is the sex offenders. Yeah, because such a big delusional quality to those women. Mm-hmm will tell you things about how they're actually doing it to help their kids and they don't see actually see it a lot of them deep down don't actually see that there's a problem with it Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's i think that's something i looked at with uh we did an episode on pedophilia Mm -hmm. and at times there's these cognitive distortions that they believe Mm -hmm. which um just are not true you know like that the child wanted it or you know like all these different things um right they're educating them that's the big one it's you know there's this kind of thought in my mind that it's very hard in one's mind to think that i am not a good parent and especially like i'm thinking of a couple clients i've had who had heavy drug use early in life and then they got sober and their kids won't talk to them because of how they were on Mm -hmm. you know methamphetamine and alcohol and it's very hard for that person to grapple with this darker side of their reality. Right. And what we're talking about to some degree is like, especially women, um, this like shadow aspect of our human nature that's capable of doing evil acts. You know, is it, it, it takes a certain level of psychological strength to be able to hold that in our mind and our conscious mind that we're capable of doing things that are not good. Yeah. Well, that's especially true of women, given okay. these cultural ideas of motherhood and what a woman's supposed to be like and things of that nature. Okay. So it's informed by to some degree by culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I think we'll get to the another item, uh, the parasitic kind of lifestyle that that one plays cultural aspects play a big role in that one as well. Yeah, let's let's keep going. Item seven, shallow affect. Unable to experience a wide range and depth of emotion. The emotions may be dramatic, shallow, and short-lived. Yeah, that goes back to kind of the pseudo-emotionality that we kind of talked about. Um, for female, for females, the labile kind of presentation of experiencing all these emotions in a short time kind of could get uh, people confused that they may actually have a, a good range of emotions, but then the shallowness, like when you actually go in there and, and ask them, you know, what is love or how did you know you were in love? And they give you the superficial thing, like the person did a lot of things for me, so we must have been in love. So, you know, again, the lack of depth into the, to the emotions. And I think you also have to be uh, very mindful of tears 
that they will often cry, but you have to kind of get an idea of why they're crying. Mm. That I think, you know, one of the things that psychopaths are very good at, male and female, is uh, getting people to project onto them. So typically a clinician, when they see somebody cry, they're projecting that the person is upset. That may not, not be actually the case, that they're upset about what they've done. They might be upset about the fact that you know, they feel criticized or things of that nature, that they feel sorry for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You talk, you talk about narcissistic mirroring. And there's a quote by Nietzsche that you threw in there, which I just, I just have to read this. I did that, <laughs> says my memory. I did not, said my, says my pride, and memory yields. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's this idea that, like, our minds play trick on, tricks on ourselves to maintain our ego strength or our, like, personhood, right? And so it's this idea that, like, we will believe lies about ourselves if it protects us psychologically, is that, or protects this image of ourself, that we exactly. ourselves want to believe yeah. about ourselves. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly it. And then, and then going a little further for the women, the narcissistic mirroring. This is what Carl and, and Ted found too, and the, their research was uh, seeing children as extensions of themselves, using children as a way to kind of narcissistic uh, kind of ways of looking and mirroring back, like um, not seeing them as as their own entity, children or, or things like that, but seeing them as as, as me and adding to some of that narcissistic kind of mirroring. And we found that on the Rorschach as well. So you said, look at the words guilt, remorse, and look at the meanings of the words. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the words will mean different things for this type of person. How can you explain that? Well, they, they normally can give like a, a textbook or, or dictionary kind of definition of it of guilt and remorse. So like, you know, I feel bad for things that I've done uh, for guilt or, or, or they'll also kind of confuse remorse and guilt together. They'll, they'll be like, what's the, you know, have you ever felt remorse? Oh yeah. I felt guilty before. Right. So kind of can kind of fusing that, but then when they actually try to explain what they feel bad for or things like that, they can't really give you a, a definition of it. So I think that's kind of going back to that that shallow affect, not really feeling yep. something so much. Right. Yep. We're still talking about the shallow affect. Yeah. yeah. And you say one more thing about the shallow affect. You said, look at attachments. Like if they said they were close to someone, did they put them on the visiting list? Yeah. Have they visited and sent letters? Like, is there any depth to this sort of superficial like statement of attachments? Or... Even when they call home, so they so they do call home. Do it for the fifteen minutes or twenty minute phone call. Are they always just talking about themselves? Do they ask, "Hey, how's so and so doing?" or "How's your health?" or things like that? It could just be one sided that they just want to let them know, and then they, yeah, I talk to my mom every day. But all right, how's your mom doing? I don't know. That would kind of be some of that kind of shallow affect and relationship stuff like that. Let's go item nine, parasitic lifestyle. So you talk about how women largely from historical records and third-party accounts, you can sort of see this parasitic lifestyle, receiving money from family or social assistance. Um, you look at how the money is spent. You look at disability, benefits revoked, not paying child support. Anything you want to mm -hmm. add about the difference between male and female parasitic lifestyle? Well, this this one was kind of cultural, um, you know, the stay at home mom, for example, right? They could say that they they're they're stay at home mom, right? They didn't work, so we wouldn't score that if it was just stay at home mom as parasitic lifestyle. But when we go into, you were staying at home as a mom, but she was getting high all day and uh, not feeding or doing anything for the children, not taking care of things, then okay that would kind of be where some of the parasitic lifestyle, say the kid was on disability. Well, they would take the disability check, not buy food, but they would use it to buy drugs or stuff, items for themselves, things like that. So the cultural aspect kind of plays a role definitely in this, this item. So you have to kind of tease out. Uh, and if you don't go into depth that I was stay at home mom, and then you just move on to the next item, you might miss some of those, those kind of behaviors. 
Let's jump to item 12, promiscuous sexual behavior. So sexual relationships with others that are impersonal, casual, or trivial, indiscriminate sexual partners. You talked about how males endorse their promiscuity with pride. Both of them describe sexual activity or deviant behavior with a sense of discomfort or reticence. I'd like to hear about that. It seems like the male would have less discomfort, but they do have discomfort. I think though that the males have have less. Uh, they they'll give the number. Like one of the you know we assess how many sexual partners would you have. Males probably would be a lot easier to give that number. The reticence comes from the females. Yeah. I had one example. Uh, I asked the uh, getting at the sexual abuse if um, how many sexual partners they had, and she had a low number. And then I asked if you had any prostitution charges, and, and no. And then using the the style, Ted said at the end of the interview, said you've been charged three times with prostitution, and she got like really anxious in her seat. She was moving around, saying no, that's not right, that's not right. So again, the reticence to kind of talk about some of the sexual behaviors, you have to kind of take a more empathetic style to kind of elicit that uh, data. Well, I think the, the males tend to talk about with a sense of pride, mm-hmm. whereas the the women don't. That they actually view it as you know being criticized, and also on the prostitution aspect, you have to be careful about that one. And in terms of clearly looking at it, because, you know, some women have been trafficked. Some women have been, uh, you know, hooked on drugs, et cetera, gotten victimized by pimps, things of that nature. So anytime I have a prostitution background and if somebody I'm evaluating, I, I want to get a sense of what, what that was like for them mm-hmm. versus, you know, like if, some of them actually say they, that they, they were into it because they liked it. Now, that would be somebody that would be a two on that, that they, you know, they liked going to swing parties. They liked, you know, performing sex in front of people, uh, getting paid for it versus somebody that is obviously traumatized and victimized by the experience that you want to be careful about that. Yep. Okay. Item 12, um, early behavioral problems. Serious behavioral problems as a child, persistent lying, cheating, theft, robbery, fire setting, disruption of classroom activities, violence, bullying, running away from home. You talked about how with, there's often a diffusion of responsibility or a rationalization of these behaviors. Is that the main sort of characteristic of females or is there, did you see that in both? Females too, it- also with kind of diffusion, getting kind of back to the kind of the trauma and stuff like that, that they may say, you know, my parents were the reason why I acted out and things like that. It, it, it's a possible that that could be kind of a, a difference. I think in general, too, I think the data kind of shows less for the females, less kind of juvenile kind of behaviors, not necessarily it might not be more gossiping or more kind of things that aren't as overt for the male male uh, psychopaths as they grow older, right? They, they are more likely maybe to do the, the fire setting or, or abusing the animals, things like that. The females might not have that, but more ostracizing, more, more gossiping, things like that, which may not kind of show up as much um, in the records uh, for female uh, younger in age than, and the, than the males. Okay. And I think it also relates to the uh, how they tend to commit their offenses with other people. Mm-hmm. So a female psychopath will be uh, hooked, typically hook up with a, either a male, a violent male, or a stronger violent woman in order to have their crimes because they may not have the actual physical prowess to dominate others. Hmm. Okay, so getting to the end of our time here, um, I'm, I'm wondering if we should do a part two. There's so many things I wanted to get to. I feel like we just ba- barely scratched the surface, but maybe that's good, you know, because maybe someone will be interested in diving into this deeper and learning about the Roshock and how that relates. And there's a lot I wanted to learn about that. And also you get into management treatment and some just, just good stuff there. Any final remarks, things that you would want people to have a takeaway from this 
um, from this discussion and from your book in general? Uh, for me, um, is just understanding that, that female offenders and female psychopaths are present differently than the males. So um, trying to understand, especially if you're interacting with this population, female offenders, is to kind of change your, your conceptualization of, of what female psychopathy is and that it's different than male uh, psychopaths is my, would be my takeaway. And, and we, I feel we do a really good job in the book um, uh, explaining all that. Yeah, I think I would agree with what Jason said, but I think I would add to it the, the element of bias that comes into this, that there's uh, this is a population in which there's a great deal of bias, that if you just do a search on female offenders, you'll find just volumes and volumes of material about how they've been victimized by the legal justice system, et cetera. And in our review of the literature, we didn't actually find that, that there was actually more data, just actual data to suggest that they actually, they had been less severely treated than the men. And I've seen that myself as a forensic psychologist, that things that, you know, uh, a woman would be sent to a program, be given all kinds of services. If it's a male, they're much more likely to be incarcerated, especially African American males, the most the most likely to be incarcerated out of all of the different demographics within a uh, forensic population. So I think that would be a big to, just to add on what Jason said. To add to that would be that you know just go by the data, not by the cultural bias. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate you guys, um, coming on, yeah. giving your wisdom. It's been fun for me to learn more about this uh, fun. And also, I don't know, there's an aspect of like, you know, I'm not a forensic psychologist or psychiatrist. I, I would probably be a horrible one actually, because I would be siding with, <laughs> I'd want to believe <laughs> them and support them. And, you know, I would be like, wanting to give them empathy where I'd probably kind of be falling into their, their traps for, for their desire, for their image to be maintained, you know? So I think it's good for someone like myself to, to have some knowledge of this, you know, to not be naive. Um, and I hope that my listeners enjoy this conversation as well. Um, I think your publisher who reached out to me will give us a discount code. So I'll put that mm -hmm. in the, in the resource library, I'll put that discount code, on the PDF that goes with this episode. So if you want to go to my resource library, psychiatrypodcast.com. And I don't think either of you have conflicts of interest other than selling a book, but you're not selling the book to patients. So it's not really yeah. the conflict of interest yeah. that we're looking at. So no conflicts of interest here. I'm not being paid by by them or their publishers. So no conflicts of interest there. And um, as always, you know, I, I prize having no conflicts of interest, just pure learning, pure growth, wisdom, empathy for our patients. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on and we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I we really appreciated it. Yeah, I really appreciate it as well. And thank you for the interest. And if there's an interest in another one, we would love to do that. That would be interesting. Yeah.